Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming that early and sit in the Brazilian winter here. So um, Dr. Krebs has asked me uh, to show a little bit about the neuroscience of upper extremities. I'm a motor neuroscientist, not an engineer, but I'm communicating a lot with engineers. So I'm trying to convey what can be done in the neurosciences to inform rehabilitation, specifically robotic rehabilitation. So my emphasis, as I just uh, showed on my title, is how can we go from analysis to assessment to intervention? So let's take a quick look where robot rehabilitation is right now, as you're probably aware of it here, specifically looking at the in-motion robots. There is a variety of robots that uh, facilitate and provide interventions for upper extremities, such as reaching wrist movements, reaching in different directions. More recently, the robots were also developed to look at lower extremities, and you will hear more later by Professor Hogan about lower extremities. So reaching and grasping has been the focus of these robots. Where can we go next? Or rather, how, let me first address, how did we get there? And in fact, the current practice of using these in motion robots specifically actually has a scientific development history. So in the 1984, 1985, specifically Professor Hogan and Professor uh, Tamar Flash have developed quantitative scientific principles under the name minimum jerk and impedance control that have become instrumental in developing the device and developing the kind of intervention that you may be now familiar with. So from there, rehabilitation has started and then also a whole series of scientific research has uh, proceeded. So this is now on reaching and wrist manipulation. So what I would like to ask and uh, go through now, that is where shall we go next? I think this type of reach grasp is very, very well covered. But what else can we do? Where can we go next? Now, let me point to something that is near and dear to physical therapists, and that is activities of daily living, such as manipulative action in the context of drinking, eating, buttoning your shirt, or even grooming, but also playing and working. So how can we proceed to gain more quantitative understanding of these activities of daily living, and then from there potentially go to assessment and then to intervention. Let me show you one example here. Where I want to focus on the action of manipulating an object such as a cup of coffee, and how can we use this task to learn more about how do we control such complex skills, how do humans learn or relearn such complex skills, and lastly, how can we then facilitate the relearning towards complex skills? So let me show you our approach, how we took a cup of coffee into a very simple quantitative model and then experiment to gain more insight into how we execute such skills. So the first step, as I emphasized, is analysis. So how do we do this? So here you see a glimpse of how we have taken this cup of coffee into a mechanical model, cart and pendulum, well known in engineering, and then use that as a representation of the dynamics of this task. What we show is that bob of a pendulum and the arc that it prescribes such that here is the equations of motion, 
that in our now virtual environment, it starts to look like this. You can see there is this very simple two-dimensional cup model that a subject manipulates by holding a robot arm and transports from left to right with the instruction not to lose the ball, not to spill the coffee. So here is one uh, representation. Oh, sorry. Um, another type of task is where we ask the subject now to manipulate the cup to be then in the target when that target box is coincident, so that determines the timing. So this is one of the tasks. Let me also say that the subject, when manipulating, feels the ball, i.e. The, the liquid, by transporting it. The instruction is not to spill the coffee, not to lose the ball. So how do we proceed from here? We asked the question whether, in this case, older adults who have a decrement in dexterity and skill, how do they differ from younger adults? And do they have safety margin? Safety margin is a big concept also in walking and other manipulative skills, where older adults fail to do tasks because their safety margins is, are not big enough. Most obvious example is in walking, stepping over obstacles, and the margin of stepping is not big enough. So safety margin is a way to assess how risky or how, how close to failure you are in executing a task. So we take this concept now into this task and ask the question, well, um, how can we analyze safety margins? How can we then assess whether older adults or patients have reduced safety margins? And then how can we develop interventions that help subjects to learn having better safety margins? So a very brief glimpse. This is, again, mechanics analysis, where we quantified in terms of uh, quantifying the energy of the ball, that it is away from escaping the cup. So just a brief glimpse of the equations here that we then take to analyze the data that we collect from the subject. So once again now, our step two is the assessment. Now, having a quantitative measure, let's assess older adults. Our design consisted of nine young, healthy people and 10 healthy older adults who performed 240 trials in four blocks of 60 trials. And they were asked to transport that cup from the start box to the end box in a target time and do not spill the coffee. So sensitively sense the forces of the ball, i.e. liquid, to bring it from left to right. So here are some first continuous kinematic data plotted over the duration of a trial. And this is the ball angle, cup position, velocity, and the applied force. As you in blue and blue and red, difficult to see here, but there is not too much difference when we simply look at the traces. However, as you might expect, what we show here is that over blocks of trials, the older adults have significantly more failures, i.e. losing the ball, even with practice. Here we count it in another way. So there is more spills in older adults, and the number of spills decreases with practice. Also, the movement error in placing the cup in time 
and the variability is indeed significantly higher in the older adults than in the young adults. But now let's look at the safety margin, which is a kind of distance of the ball. How much is it away from escape? And how does that change over one trial? So you see the traces here over the movement time. And the young ones have a higher energy margin than the older adults, meaning, as we expect, older adults are more likely to lose the ball. They're not as good in safely transporting that cup of coffee. So this is quantified and summarized here, where the young adults in blue are, have much higher safety margins than younger, uh, sorry, than the older adults. And it, it increases, but remains significantly below the, the young adults. So in summary, and this is a first step into a new type of task, I think we can say here what we learned is that safety margins is a sensitive measure for skilled behavior. In fact, as we showed, then also older adults can have the ability to improve by 30%. This quantitative analysis of the task was the basis for having this very sensitive measure. So what the point, what I want to convey to you is how um, in-depth analysis of a task can give you a very sensitive measure then to be used for assessment and subsequently as assessment for any intervention. We haven't gone that far. So this is, at the moment, state of affairs. But now, let me show you one other example. And you may say that, well, this is very, very sophisticated, but older adults behave rather well. So our patients are much more complex, and we cannot do such things. Well, let me show you an example where we looked at very well, a playing task, I should first say, a throwing task. And we applied our approach to a very, very difficult population that you see here exemplified, and that is children with secondary dystonia due to cerebral palsy. So how can we again use our quantitative approach to develop an assessment and then intervention to modify their behavior? So this was the population that we looked at. And the task, again, we chose a manipulation task, a throwing task. And specifically here, it was what we called shuffleboard task, where you take a puck and you throw it to hit a target. Again, we simplified it greatly. The task implies that you throw this puck to, and this is the virtual display, to a target location, which is as far as possible. But if you overshoot, you lose all your points. So you want to throw the ball all the way into this high point area. But it is risky, because if you're not accurate, you overshoot. And that is, in the context of the game, failure. So here is how we implemented it, such that our very handicapped children could actually execute this task. The children were in a manipulandum here. Oops, I'm sorry. The children's arm was in a manipulandum with Velcro straps, or sometimes not even strapped, because they had very uncontrolled behavior. And they were sitting in front of a desk, often in their wheelchair, and interacted with that game on a computer screen. And they released the ball, 
at a certain velocity that released the ball and that was then shown in the virtual environment to then hit the target and get, get certain points. Now, our specific question was, these children are seemingly completely out of control. Can they actually, do they have some control of their behavior? And specifically, can we then facilitate their control? Our hypothesis was that due to their seemingly uncontrolled, highly variable behavior, we do not see that there is a smidget of control behind. So if we can reduce their variability, maybe there is some control that we can carve out. So in this very simple task, we reduce their variability. And I'm not going into any detail. Instead of showing them their veridical throw, we reduce the variability. So let's leave it at that for now. And what we see is here in 200 trials, we had just an no manipulation, veridical throwing, and then we reduced their variability in the next set of 200 trials. What we see here is that with their reduced trials, they indeed threw the ball further and they gained more points, so they adapted by by, with this intervention, they adapted and achieved ultimately better behavior, which we summarize here for 15 subjects, where this is the release velocity in the no manipulation case, and it increased in virtually every subject. So every of these highly handicapped people altered their behavior by simply perceptually changing their variability. So we conclude these children could alter their strategy with some changed perceptual information. And manipulation of variability presents a way to influence behavior. So let me conclude by just saying thank you to all of you to coming here and to also point to the people in my lab who do all this work. So thank you very much.